Hi everyone, it is Tanya Hertz here and tonight we are going to be talking a little bit about ethics and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. All right, so ethics. When we're talking about ethics, we're talking about <clears throat> how, how much an authority figure is uh, adhering to generally accepted moral norms. Again, ethics and um, religion are not necessarily linked. In fact, um, when you look at correlative studies, there are, um, there are a lot of correlative studies done, and it shows that there typically is not a correlation between uh, believing in a higher power or, or being religious and being uh, ethical. They don't necessarily uh, go hand in hand um, in fact, there are some research studies sh that show that people who are um, very, have very deeply held religious views and are um, uh, fundamentalists, uh, they tend to uh, very often behave less ethically. And so um, not always true. Again, this is just an aggregate and, and, um, and for individuals that could be, that could be different. Some people uh, may need to have some sort of faith in order to behave morally, but it's just not true for everyone. Okay, so um, there's a lot of research that shows why people behave ethically, why people behave unethically, and um, you know how and why people actually violate these, these norms. <clears throat> and we look at behaviors that are becoming um, somewhat prevalent in organizations and, and why that's happened. And, and we see that um, unethical behavior, it, it, it is happening uh, to a large degree in, in organizations. And, and those behaviors, they could be illegal or they could be um, legal, but unethical, right? So um, that's another, another point that, that I, I should make is that um, illegal does not necessarily sorry, mean unethical, and unethical does not necessarily mean illegal, okay? People can behave completely 100% uh, um, unethical, and it could be 100% adhering to the law, right? Um, and, and they could be <laughs> behaving in a highly ethical manner, and it could still be illegal, right? So, there are four components of ethical decision-making, and we'll go through them one by one, but it's important to note that the context is important. Uh, you've heard that saying, one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. So in this, um, you know, in that context, if you think of the bad apple as the employee and the barrel as the organization, um, it can, we can see unethical behavior have, uh, have uh, uh, an impact on the entire barrel um, when you have some bad apples in that bunch, or you can see good apples in an organization that tends to be a, a bad barrel where, where ethics is, um, or unethical behavior is not only condoned, but, but even encouraged and promoted. And those, uh, generally good apples or, or people who don't behave unethically can begin to behave unethically. It's one of those, um, it's one of those things that can spread very quickly in an organization. So we as leaders in an organization, we want to lead from the top and, and to encourage ethical behavior and to cut off unethical behavior at, at the first possible chance that we can. So a large, uh, portion of being able to, to behave ethically and to make sure that your employees behave ethically is to um, be morally aware, right? So this is, um, this is when we, as, uh, as, as leaders in an organization, we pay attention. Um, we recognize um, that we recognize when a moral issue actually exists and that degree, it depends largely on our moral attentiveness. So this is um, how much we as, as leaders are, are paying attention to moral um, quandaries and considering issues of morality. And it also has to do with the moral intensity, right? So if something is, um, if something is, is, has a high moral intensity, that means that there's, uh, 
you know, there's a potential that people could get hurt. And then there's also times in history when there's a lot of social press pressure to behave morally. And, um, and during those times, that's a higher moral intensity time. And if, when you, when you put those two considerations together, that will, um, that's, uh, that will dictate how morally aware uh, a person or organization will be. Um, moral judgment, this, um, this is the, the stage in the process where we actually will uh, determine what is the, the, the morally right course of action, the right thing to do. So remember with, with ethics, it's not clear cut. So it's not like the law. It's not, um, this is a clear, this is right and this is wrong. There are gray areas and many gray areas, and it's um, it's dependent upon the uh, it's dependent upon the the leader in the organization to identify the right course of action for um, you know for that organization and for the people in the organization, and um, it, it it depends largely on uh, how how developed that person is in terms of their uh, morality, right? And there are different stages of cognitive moral development and, um, and so going through each of the stages, this pre-conventional, conventional, and um, post-conventional or principled, uh, you see often this, um, the, the, the bulk of the population is in the conventional stage of, of moral development. That's when, when we as people are making decisions about morality based on what other people expect of us, um, what, we, um, what our family expects of us, what society expects, what, um, you know, what would happen if, if we made a decision and it was on the front page of a newspaper. Um, when you're making decisions based on, on questions like that, that's a really conventional um, moral development. Um, if you are, uh, if you're making decisions about right and wrong, um, thinking about how would my grandma feel if I did this, and and I think all of us have, have maybe been at that stage at some point in our lives where, where we um, you know we think about things like this, or um, thinking about right and wrong um, based on what would happen if everybody behaved this way, right? What if what if everybody speeded? What if everybody broke the law? How would that affect society? That's a very um, it's a moral. Um, development um, and it's a very conventional moral development. It's, it's development past the pre-conventional stage and the pre-conventional stage is when we're making decisions about right and wrong based, about, based upon uh, consequences for us, right? Um, how, would, how would it affect us? So children are at the pre-conventional moral development stage. So they might not take away a toy from another child because they know they'd get in trouble. They'd get, um, you know, they'd maybe get put into timeout or get their hands smacked or something like this. Right. That's a pre-conventional uh, moral development. And you can see a lot of adults are still at that stage. Um, a lot of older adults are at that stage where they don't speed because they don't want to get a ticket, right? They don't break the law because they don't want to spend time in jail. That's a pre-conventional uh, moral development. Now, uh, most moral adults will progress past that stage to more of a conventional level and they'll think more about society at large and their family and their reputation. Uh, but then there's even a stage past that, um, a higher type of moral development, a more principled moral development. And that's when we, we reference um, whether or not a decision is right or wrong based on, on our own deeply held principles and beliefs. And uh, we'll make decisions and you even, this is when you even take law out of it, right? So you don't care about whether or not you could go to jail for it or if it's, um, you know, what society thinks, but is it truly the right thing to do? Um, you know, sometimes it might even be illegal, but, uh, but, but still the right thing to do. And um, I often think about uh, when, when it was, when we still had segregation in this country and, um, there was a group of, of Americans and mostly black Americans who went and sat at the lunch counter and demanded to be served in an all white restaurant. That is a, a principal post-conventional uh, moral development. And you see that right now with what's happening in society with a lot of people who are standing up for, for, for rights, for things that they believe is, uh, is unfair in this country, even though it means sometimes for them financial ruin, it means, um, it, 
might mean going to jail for, for what they believe in, but that's a highly principled level of, of moral development. Yeah. Doesn't have, you don't have to necessarily be against the law in order for it to be principled or post-conventional, and hopefully it wouldn't be in a, in a more principled society, um, but sometimes that does happen. Right? Uh, so another component of, of moral decision-making is uh, the intent, and that's how committed we are uh, to a course of action. And that's really driven by how we see ourselves as, as, um, as a moral person or how we look at ourselves in general. And, um, you know, some, one example I like to give sometimes is, is, you know, imagine that you had access to the, the midterm that I'm, that we're going to be taking in this class here. And one of the students says, Hey, by the way, um, you know, Professor Hertz put the midterm up and she didn't realize that she had the answers there for an hour and I downloaded all of them. You know, they're not there anymore, but if you want them, I could give them to you, right? Now, what would you do, right? What would you do? Now, if you were uh, at the pre-conventional level, you might, not, you might not cheat on that exam because you're afraid of getting caught. That's pre-conventional. At the conventional level, you might not cheat on them because you think, well, then my degree doesn't have a lot of, 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 of weight and, and what would my, um, what would my mom think of me? And what would my spouse think of me? And uh, if I did cheat um, at the conventional or principled level, you would just say, no, I, I'm not the kind of person who believes in this. And I, I just wouldn't do it. It's against uh, my moral beliefs. And how moral you see yourself um, will have a big impact on whether or not you would cheat on the exam. And um, I hope none of you would. I don't think you would. So how important is trust? Um, back, to the, back to the question that we ask all the time. We, we look at all of these different variables in relation to job performance and organizational commitment. And there is um, a correlation between trust and, um, and each of these. Uh, so trust has a moderate positive correlation or effect on uh, job performance. And that's really because um, when we are trusting in an organization, it frees up <clears throat> excuse me, it frees up our mental space so that we don't have to be worried about uh, how people will behave or, or um, if people will do what they say they're going to do. And so it gives us more time to actually work and, and engage in task performance. Uh, but it's just a moderate, it's just a moderate correlation. Uh, but there is a very strong positive correlation between trust and organizational commitment. And that's just because we need to trust our leaders in our organization and our um, colleagues in order to um, to bond with those people. And the more we trust them, the more we bond with them. And then the more committed we are, the happier we are there, the more we want to stay in the organization. And so there's a strong, strong, strong uh, correlation of being a, a trustworthy person, a trustworthy organization, and having committed uh, employees who want to be there, want to be there. And um, we can develop our, our organizational um, our organizational reputation for being a, a trustworthy organization by engaging in things like CSR, corporate social responsibility. And there is, of course, a legal and ethical and a social component, but, but um, CSR, corporate social responsibility, largely is an ethical consideration, not as much a legal consideration. Uh, and this is um, a, a, a different view of, uh, of capitalism right? The old view of capitalism was always uh, the shareholder view of capitalism. And um, shareholder capitalism was that, that notion that we had, above all other uh, obligations, we had an obligation as capitalists to uh, look out for our shareholders. And I don't know about you, but when I was back in, in business school back in the day, it was drilled into our heads that the number one obligation that any organization had was to maximize shareholder wealth. And um, it was so much so that, that many people thought that that was a law. They thought that there was an actual legal obligation to maximize shareholder wealth over everything else. And so cor corporations would behave even unethically to that end to make sure that no matter what, we were looking out for the shareholders first. Well, it's not a law. First, first and foremost, it's not a law. And um, more of a stakeholder view of capitalism um, is, is 
that we don't just have an obligation to our shareholders, but we have a view to all of our stakeholders. So stakeholder is different than shareholder. A stakeholder is anyone who has a stake in how we behave. And, um, and this is, um, it's, it's often called, um, um, well, there's a lot of different names for it, social entrepreneurship. Um, well, uh, I, I like stakeholder capitalism. It's one term that I've been uh, hearing a lot. And actually, uh, uh, t the Tory Project, uh, David, I can't remember his last name right now, but uh, David from the Tory Project, he's been uh, really he's really uh, latched onto this term and, and I love it. It's a, it perfectly describes uh, how organizations uh, should look at their, their greater obligation to all of their stakeholders and they should take into consideration all of, um, you know, all of the people that they do business with, the society at large when they're conducting their business. So, um, and it's up to, it's up to uh, different organizations to, uh, you know, to make their decisions, uh, their decisions about how important it is, but by and large, most most uh, companies realize that in this day and age, there is an expectation that they have um, as an organization that they have a greater responsibility um, to more than just just those those shareholders. So, anyways, that was ethics. We'll see you again soon. Take care.